Good morning and welcome to Farm Factor. I'm your host, Jamie Bloom. Kyle Bauer is back at Kansas State's Risk and Profit Conference and he talks to Michael Taylor about land values in Kansas and how it can be difficult to determine the current market value. Next up, Greg Akagi brings us the Kansas Soybean Update. Then Dwayne Taves talks with KLA President Barb Downey from Downey Ranch about transition planning and how to successfully transfer the operation to the next generation without skipping a beat. Next, learn what's going on around the state with the Kansas Farm Bureau update. And then Kyle and Dwayne talk spam. Learn something new about the other white meat in a can on Plain Talk. It's all coming up, stay tuned. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com. The Kansas Wheat Innovation Center in Manhattan is rediscovering ways to get improved varieties and new genetics in the hands of farmers faster. Grower-led and checkoff-funded research initiatives are bringing about positive change. This grassroots leadership provides a strong voice in Topeka and Washington, D.C. Now is the time to partner with Kansas Wheat in moving wheat forward. Kansas Wheat Commission and Kansas Association of Wheat Growers, farmers investing in their future and yours. Log on to rediscoverwheat.org for the 15th annual Fall Bull Sale at Gardner Angus Ranch, Monday, September 30th at 9 a.m. Featuring approximately 450 registered bulls, 160 registered females, including 35 cows and 125 heifers, and 300 bred commercial females. These are elite herd sire prospects and rank in the top percentiles of the Angus breed for calving ease, growth, and end product merit. Catalog will be available at GardnerAngus.com. Register for online bidding at LiveAuction.tv. It's business as usual producing value-added seed stock that provides opportunities for profitability regardless of our customer's chosen marketing endpoint. See you in September at The Ranch. This segment brought to you by Kansas Farm Bureau, the voice of agriculture. To join today or for more information, go to KFB.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Welcome to Farm Factor. Kyle is at the Risk and Profit Conference with Michael Taylor to talk about determining land values in the state. Hi, this is Kyle Bauer visiting with Michael Taylor. She's a professor at Kansas State University uh, in the Ag Econ Department. We'll be talking land values. I'm visiting with her at the Risk and Profit Conference. Uh, you know, I was interested as I sat in on your talk, um, land value data is difficult. It is. Um, Kansas is a non-disclosure state, so actually uh, you and I can't go see what everybody's bought and sold ground for. Only licensed appraisers can do that. Um, so actually we we see maybe what our neighbors sold for or an auction, but we're pretty limited on, on the number of sales that we can actually observe in the marketplace. And does that lack of data affect anything? Does it hurt things? Does it help things? I think it affects our ability to accurately answer USDA surveys on land values. Um, so when they send that survey around, people, um, unless you're buying and selling ground actively, they don't necessarily know where the market is at. Um, and so they're given their best guess. But I think it sometimes it can, it can cause problems with whether or not the survey is terribly accurate relative to market. You know, you see almost monthly in a publication of some kind, uh, real... Uh, it seemed like to me high values uh, that land has sold for, but maybe one or two in a state. Do you think most of the time those are representative? I think it really depends. Um, on, on some of those sales, they can be representative of the market, and in other cases, you might have two neighbors bidding against each other, and, and you end up with a, a higher than market um, a value on that ground. Um, the the trick, I think, is you know we at K State were able to work with uh, the property valuation department out of Topeka, and we get data that allows us to look at the entire market. Uh, and so sometimes people are a little bit surprised at the numbers that we get, but I just have to remind them that we're able to look at all the different sales, you know, even the private treaty sales and things like that, that, that everybody else is not able to see. Kansas is a big state with uh, differences in rainfall and differences in land use. Uh, what have you seen for trends and values in the state of Kansas? 
Well, there's a lot of localization to land markets. So we have to, to be careful sometimes about generalizing across the state. But overall, in the past four years, we've seen about a 20% decline in land values. And that seems like a lot, and I, and I won't say that it isn't, but we had such a run up uh, in the, the 2011 to 20. Uh, 14 period where land values were going up by 15 to 20 percent every year and so we've we've cut back a little bit on that value um, what you see in local markets is that you'll sometimes see you know um, a sale of high quality land and that'll make people think that the the market's still strong uh, but maybe you've got you know other pieces of land and other qualities of land and that might be more reflective of what the market's actually doing and I know you you we're look at Kansas data, but surely you go to meetings. If we're down 20, is that kind of indicative nationwide, or are we an anomaly? We're not an anomaly. I, I look at Iowa, I look at the rest of the Corn Belt, and we've all adjusted back. I mean, profitability in the ag sector, you know, has not supported land values for the last few years. And so everybody's land values have made some kind of an adjustment uh, relative to, to, where, to where we were in 2015. As I look at uh, reduction in land values, I think about uh, balance sheets. Do you get inquiries for that, for farmers determining their balance sheet and or their lenders and or um, estate settlements? Yes, uh, we do get quite a bit of, of um, inquiries about that. We also have our Ag Lenders Conference in October, and we talk a lot with the, with the lenders at that point in time about where land values are at. And, and I will say, even though we dropped off or contracted about 20%, um, land values are still holding um, better than what you might think, given where com profitability is. And so everybody is sort of, I think, um, a little bit nervous as to where things are headed. That's the big question is, are we, are we going to stabilize? or is it going to go down a little bit more? Um, and that's really uncertain given profitability, given the uncertainty in the trade you know, situation, and, um, and just the forecast for grain prices not necessarily being stronger over the next couple of years. This is Kyle Bauer reporting. Thanks, Kyle. Stay tuned for this week's Kansas Soybean Update coming up right after these messages. What if sustainability were synonymous with U.S. soy? If energy efficiency, water quality, and soil health help define U.S. soy's value, that future is here, the time is now. To meet end user demands, the Soybean Checkoff is committing to sustainability that's achievable, worthwhile, and enduring. A message from the Kansas Soybean Commission, the Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Clyde Sutton, Nest City, Kansas. Lived on this place all my life. About a year and a half ago, got to where I couldn't saddle a horse. The pain was terrible. Read about stem cell. First it wasn't for me, then they started doing neck and back. Went and had it done. As you can see, I saddled a horse. I'm still building fence. Love to shoot a shotgun rifle, and I'm able to participate. Not like I used to, but nevertheless I can do the things I used to do, and life is good. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. Valley Vet Supply. This segment brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff. Progress powered by Kansas farmers. Welcome back to Farm Factor and the Kansas Soybean Update. This is the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Bob Hazelwood from Barrington joins us. He's also a Kansas Soybean Commissioner. And Bob, you recently returned from a trip to Japan that was led by the U.S. Meat Export Federation. What was the purpose of the trip? Well, the main purpose of the trip was to help promote U.S. pork and beef into the Japan market. And it's important that the soybean industry maintain a strong partnership with the U.S. beef and pork industry. The Kansas Soybean Commission partners with U.S. Meat Export Federation on some projects to help promote U.S. pork in Japan. As we, and as we all know, U.S. pork consumes a lot of soybeans in their feed rations. And that is just one way that we can get more use of our soybeans. And this is on top of what potentially is coming down the line of a bilateral trade agreement between the United States and Japan. Yes, which we hope is going to be good news where the Paris 
Japan has on U.S. pork and beef. I think they're hoping to get them to equal playing percentages compared to the other countries that they import beef from. Bob, has the U.S. maintained a good relationship with Japan with regards to the importing of U.S. soybeans into their country? Yes. We're still one of their, pri- we're their primary supplier for soybeans. Japan is a more mature market and has been a long-term customer. They don't have the facilities or the capacity to produce as much meat as their population is consuming, so that's why we work with the U.S. and the U.S. To find those customers and to find those areas in Japan that uh, are in need of that, not only for what you provide for U.S. pork and beef, but uh, what could go into Japan, too. Yes, all the pork is in the grocery store or retail level. You know, it's labeled whether it is U.S. pork or probably labeled that it's U.S. pork alongside with the locally raised pork. And then also the U.S. beef is probably labeled as such. Uh, the U.S. beef kind of sits into a market that is above the Australian grass-fed and below the Japan-raised Wagyu beef. So there's a real good place for it to fit in there. You had talked about it being a robust market, but with the potential down the road of that bilateral trade agreement, it's got to excite the industry, beef side, pork side, soybean side, and other sides too. Yes, I think there's a growing demand for U.S pork and beef. The consumer there likes the product, and if we could get the tariffs agreement straightened out, I think that this will put U.S. beef, pork and beef at a more competitive level to the, everything else in the marketplace. Bob, we appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. That's Bob Hazelwood from Barrington, who is a Kansas Soybean Commissioner, and he joins us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Learn more at kansassoybeans.org. For Kansas Soybeans, I'm Greg Akagi. Coming up next on Farm Factor, Dwayne Taves talks with KLA President Barb Downey about smoothly transitioning the operation to the next generation. Sure Crop Fertilizers was started by my father, Don Sherman, and my mother, Shirley Sherman. Family business has started in the 80s. We predominantly focus on plant nutrients and what we can do to give growers better responses for with the fertilizer dollars that they do and what we can do to you know, make those things work better for the grower. We're based out of Seneca, Kansas, we work with growers in their soil analysis to figure out what they need and then we can put those in a blend that gives them the best results and so that we can deliver that direct to their farm so that they have those nutrients where they need them, when they need them, and so that they can apply them in a manner that's, that's very efficient to them and, and works well on their planting systems and what they're doing. Sure Crop Fertilizers has been around for a long time. We always say we're, we're big enough to take care of everything you need, but yeah, we're small enough to do it quickly. You can get a hold of us at 1-800-635-4743. Um, our website is surecropfertilizers.com. And you can always email me at Corey at surecropfertilizers.com. And with any questions you have, we'd be glad to answer and work with you. Kim Mannering with Hardy Insurance. Today, we will talk about employee safety and work comp coverage. On your farm, do you ask your friends to come help? Are they considered employees or neighbors helping neighbors? Did you know that you can be held responsible just as if it's a work comp accident? Give me a call, we can discuss. 316-945-6733. The Kansas Wheat Innovation Center in Manhattan is rediscovering ways to get improved varieties and new genetics in the hands of farmers faster. Grower-led and checkoff-funded research initiatives are bringing about positive change. This grassroots leadership provides a strong voice in Topeka and Washington, D.C. Now is the time to partner with Kansas Wheat in moving wheat forward. Kansas Wheat Commission and Kansas Association of Wheat Growers, farmers investing in their future and yours. Log on to rediscoverwheat.org. This segment brought to you by SureCrop, liquid crop nutrition delivered right to your farm. We're back. Now we join Dwayne Taves as he talks with Barb Downey about transition planning. Dwayne Taves joining you once again with Ag AM in Kansas and an opportunity to catch up with Barb Downey, uh, Downey Ranches, uh, KLA president. Uh, Barb, uh, we think about uh, the business of, of agriculture. Unfortunately, there are too many operations that don't think in business-like terms. And I know you've got a special cause that, uh, that you think more people should pay attention to and, and start planning now. 
I do, Duane. Um, we face this in our family, in our situation, both in the generation prior to mine, and then we are planning currently for the next generation. But what I'm talking about is transition planning. How do we take these large, often very valuable, complex operations and ensure that they transition to the next generation without skipping a beat? You know, a lot of operations do a very good job of tax planning. Uh, and making sure that we don't hand everything we have to the government. But what we fail to do oftentimes is plan on how to transition that business successfully. We think about why that's such an important uh, point. Uh, given the current average age of, of a producer today in the United States, there are some s significant holdings that are going to transfer to another generation in the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, and we really need to try and do that as seamlessly as possible so that uh, production agriculture continues to do what they do best. Yeah, I'm, I'm on the younger end and I'm 55 years old. So a significant number of my peers are even older than I am looking at either retirement health concerns. I mean, you and I never know when that bus is going to hit us when we're crossing the street someday. Um, we can't plan for when we will die, but we can certainly plan in terms of our business and our estate for what happens when we do. One of the big issues, uh, and we've heard for a number of years, there have been people that talk about this, is as bringing that next generation in and how you do that in a manner that's fair, equitable uh, to the uh, to the parents, but, but fair to the kids as well. Yeah, and fair uh, and equitable can often be two different things. And we've got a couple of things to consider when we're transitioning that business. Number one, can the operational uh, folks, can they afford to keep something together? Have we set up the structure of the corporation or the business in such a way that they can continue to run that business? Have we set them up with the infrastructure? The other part of it is the leadership. Uh, me as, as um, you know, I'm not used to dealing with my kids as equals. And when they come back to the operation, should I be so fortunate that they would, I've got to have a plan in place where I'm starting to develop leadership skills in them, develop them into independent thinkers. Their vision for our business may not be my vision. I've got to recognize that as valuable and have set up a competent professional to take the reins. And the realities are, as uh, you referenced, uh, they're going to have new and differing ideas uh, from what mom and dad may have had. But the reality is uh, mom and dad won't be around forever. And it certainly would be advisable that they, they learn some of those hard knocks in life uh, before they're ultimately responsible solely by themselves. You know, no, no Fortune 500 company would have all of their eggs in one bas basket. They have plans. They have uh, leadership plans. Uh, they have development plans in place. We've got to do that same thing for our operations, for our kids, for uh, that maybe the next generation is not even related to us. But we need to have those plans in place so that our operation and our time invested is, is, goes on to the next generation. Well, our thanks to Barb Downey president of the Kansas Livestock Association, joining us on Ag AM in Kansas. Jamie, we'll send it back to you. Thanks, Dwayne. Come back after the break for this week's Kansas Farm Bureau update. What if sustainability were synonymous with U.S. soy? If energy efficiency, water quality, and soil health help define U.S. soy's value, that future is here, the time is now. To meet end user demands, the Soybean Checkoff is committing to sustainability that's achievable, worthwhile, and enduring. A message from the Kansas Soybean Commission, the Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. Valley Vet Supply. This segment brought to you by Kansas Farm Bureau, the voice of agriculture. To join today or for more information, go to kfb.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Welcome back to Farm Factor and the Kansas Farm Bureau Update. We're here at Colby, uh, third day of our Farm Bureau experience started on Monday outside Lawrence. Uh, like I said, I told the group tonight, I think, this is something you do only when you have a chance to go with a group and see places you'd never see otherwise. And I learned extremely amount. There's places in Kansas I saw I didn't know existed, mostly in agribusiness, and 
the type of things they're doing for the communities and employing the people. And it's pretty amazing, actually, what's being done. I started in Morris County as a county secretary, and that's where I first learned about Farm Bureau and stuff, and I was totally hooked on the association side because I was insurance and association secretaries both. And then we moved to Manhattan when my husband took a job in Alma as an ag teacher. And uh, we had a farm up there that where we moved to and stuff. And so then um, I, I was just involved in Farm Bureau and got, eventually went to back to work and got a job up there and worked at the state headquarters for 26 years. And then I retired from that and went to... Um, didn't wasn't involved for a couple three years and then Wilbonte County where we're members uh, asked me to be on the board and so I've been on there for like seven years now and three years of that has been president and it's been a lot of fun a lot of good people made lots and lots of friends and the, just the things that Farm Bureau do, do in the county um, they they really are the voice of agriculture. Stay with us we'll be back after the break with Plain Talk. Kim Mannering with Hardy Insurance. Today we will talk about umbrella coverage. Did you know that if your cattle get out, you could be held liable for that? Call me, let's have a discussion. 316-945-6733. You don't have to be a farmer or rancher to become a Kansas Farm Bureau member. Anyone can join. As a member, you'll get discounts on things like hotels and entertainment, health and wellness services, cell phone plans, and more. You'll also strengthen the lives of your fellow Kansans and help build strong, prosperous communities through agriculture advocacy and education. Join us today. Visit kfb.org slash join to learn more. This segment brought to you by Santa Fe Trail Meats in Overbrook. Let us help feed your family. Welcome back. Now let's see what Kyle and Dwayne are up to on Plain Talk. Hi, this is Kyle Bauer with Plain Talk with the guy that knows that when the vehicle starts making a lot of turns, you're close to the destination, Dwayne Taves. Oh. I never thought about that, but you know, on the on the GPS thing, right? I don't need them until I, well, Get either getting, <laughs> oh, getting there in the last, you know, mile. Sure. Or getting away from there in the first mile. <laughs> in the first mile. Sometimes in downtown areas, I mean. It takes a while to get lined out. Right. But once you do. Right can make some time. Well, have you ever done GPS like from here to Denver? It says go 538 yeah. miles, turn left. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Your fact or fiction question of the day, Kyle Bauer. The term spam in the food industry refers to a product made of shoulder pork and ham. Fact or fiction? That's absolutely a fact, Jack. Yeah. I'm a Shoulder, huge Spam pork fan. and ham. I told you I had a softball to for you today. I've been the Spam today. Museum. Uh, so are you kidding me? No. In There's Austin, a museum? In Austin, Minnesota. There's a Spam Museum. I've been there. Yeah. Uh, they have absolutely. samples? Uh, they have a snack bar. A snack bar. <laughs> Can you I, buy a Spam at the snack bar? I like Spam, but it's kind of expensive. And, it uh, is more so than what I think it used to be. Or you, you know, think by, it's possible it's higher priced now than what it used to be? Well, I don't know what it used to be. I, I don't, don't know. know as it was ever. I kind of you thought think it at used some to, point it was a cheap man's food. I think it. I thought it was. Uh, well, I suppose if hogs were really cheap, it would make a difference. But um, um, I mean, I don't know what one of those little cans are, but I doubt if they're more than a pound, and they'll be oh, four dollars. Yeah. You, you know, go. something like that. But. Uh, when we went down the Mississippi um, on in a boat, Roy Henry and I, right. we took Spam. Of course, he's a pork producer. Yeah. We took cans of Spam for our lunch every day. Uh -huh. And so we, whenever it come time for lunch, we'd open a can of Spam. Of course, New you can don't, of Spam. You don't need a can opener to open a can of Spam. That's correct. You just got a key, and you can turn it, open right. the top. We had a loaf of bread. Take a pocket knife, sliver us off a few pieces. Two ha two pieces makes one sandwich. Uh huh. Very efficient, <laughs> and we supported the pork industry the entire way down the Mississippi. There you go. We actually didn't go. We only went halfway down the Mississippi. Uh, uh, half a Mississippi well, trip. Yeah. <laughs> we went from St. Paul, Minnesota to Hannibal, Missouri. But while in St. Paul, you went to the Spam Museum. No, no, no. That's in Austin, oh, Minnesota. In Austin. 
That's in Austin, Minnesota. Now, Roy, you made a special trip for that. I go up there a lot. <laughs> Good friends of ours live there. Yes, so. yes, they do. So you got huh. a fact or fiction me? You already did. I did. That was spam. That oh. was the deal. You won. That was just so easy. It's like, how could I? I told you I was going to throw you a softball today. I what was... is your favorite lunch meat? Oh. You know, if you were to make sandwiches for a week, that was the only thing right. out of one thing. You could only make for one when one thing and you I'm have to a, live on those sandwiches yeah. all week long. I'm a big ham guy and I don't know if that's quote unquote. Okay, I think there's a difference so are you yeah. talking thick cut ham or slivered, slivered ham? Slivered ham. Yeah, that is pretty it's hard to beat slivered ham. I mean, I can going back to bachelor days and college days and and everything in between. I mean, and I'm a big hot ham and cheese guy, so yeah. and the microwave made that a whole lot easier. Yeah. I mean, you can toss a little slivered ham and a slice of cheese in the microwave, and well, that's just like having a meal right there. Well, I'm a bologna guy. I mean, I was raised on bologna. My wife hates it, so she didn't buy it for 20 years. Then I realized after 20 years they would let me in the grocery store. Yeah. So I started going in the grocery store and buying my own bologna. Now, do you buy the... My dad preferred to get it at the meat counter where they had a block of it and they and they cut it fresh. It fresh, yeah. Um, the place I go doesn't do that. When I was a kid, they did it that way. But right now, I go to the case where there is like forty-seven different kinds of bologna, hmm. and I look for the one that's the cheapest, made of roadkill. I suspect, and I buy that one. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Jamie Bloom, and I hope you enjoyed today's show. See you next week on Farm Factor. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com. Western Kansas Wildlife Travel Center, right here in my hometown of Oakley, Kansas. We're the front door of Western Kansas, located on three main highways, I-70, US-83, and US-40. And all those roads lead to history, beautiful scenery, and adventure, no matter which direction you go. We now have an IHOP that brand that you've trusted up and down the road in all your travels is staffed with local folks, real people, just like you and me, and we're waiting on you to join us. So for fun, adventure, fuel up, fuel your body, and let's have some fun. Promo Source is a unique group of marketing specialists with one mission, help your ag business grow. Each affiliate has their own area of expertise and they work together to bring you advice, products, and services. To get started, visit agpromosource.com. Ag Promo Source, together we grow. Imagine turning soybean oil, used cooking oils, and waste animal fats into fuel so amazing it drives U.S. jobs and our economy forward. Learn more about biodiesel at americasadvancedbiofuel.com. Kim Mannering with Hardy Insurance. Today we will talk about umbrella coverage. Did you know that if you're held liable in any type of accident, the judgment can claim your assets? Please give me a call so we can discuss 316-945-6733.